the, the topic is multidisciplinary use of the dome. And that session is led by Joseph Ekin. And here we already see his screen. He's going to present together with Ahmad Kazai and Dana Thompson. So uh, the room is yours. Thank you so much. And hello, everyone. Uh, good mid morning uh, for those of us on the East Coast again. So my name is Joe Aiken. I'm the tech director of the Hotung Visualization Lab at Colgate University in the middle of nowhere, New York, as I like to say, uh, middle of farmland. Uh, my co-hosts, I want to thank uh, those, uh, Dana Thompson from Ball State University and uh, Ahmad Hazai uh, from Colgate University as well. And so we want to basically have this panel to kind of show other uses of the dome. You know, we always do astronomy in the dome. Uh, at Colgate, we are really good about uh, trying to bring other, oh, thanks, Mark. Uh, so other uses of the curricular in the dome. And so this, we hope that uh, this panel will actually show some sample cases of that and get some discussions going, how to get other people to be in your dome from the art department to geosciences uh, to basically across campus. So I am going to stop talking and hand it over to Dana uh, to be our first speaker. Uh, for this panel. Take it away, Dana. Hi, good morning, everyone. Um, hope everyone's having a great morning. It's 2.22 in the morning for me here in Indiana, um, where Ball State University is located. Uh, so I am the planetarium director for the Ball State University's Brown Planetarium. And um, I want to give you a quick overview of our dome. And uh, by the way, it is Dana with a Y. Joe, you owe me a drink sometime for getting my name spelled wrong. All right, so um, on our website, uh, we have a um, virtual tour of the planetarium. It's really just a 360 degree view, but it does a pretty good job of showing our theater here. Uh, we have a hybrid system. We have a Godo uh, Kronos 2 analog or optomechanical projector. And then we have a 4K digital system run by RSA Cosmos. And um, we have 152 seats, four spots for wheelchairs. And we're on a university campus that has over 22,000 students. Uh, we can present from back here at the console of the dome. Uh, in addition to our 4K center mounted projectors. We also have two inset projectors for PowerPoints and anything else if there's some classes being done in the dome. Um, and we can also in here present anywhere in the room with iPad capabilities. So we have a pretty flexible, pretty clean, um, sleek design here. And we can see classes come through, um, but we also serve the public with public shows as well as elementary school students. Um, so I'm going to actually be sharing a link to my video in the chat here. So let me stop sharing just really quick so I can get to that. Um, and if you want to follow along on YouTube and uh, have some interaction with this 360 degree video I put together, um, you can do so. It's in the chat right now. If you can't get to that, or um, if you just want to follow along with me, I have it on my screen right here. I'll give you just a moment to get to that video. Either way is fine. Um, the YouTube video, you're going to have to definitely look around more because it is 360. Uh, whereas on my screen here, um, you can see a little bit more because I zoomed out a little bit, okay? So we do work with other departments on campus and uh, this is just a sequence of some examples of some visuals that we uh, do with those different departments. So I'm gonna go ahead and hit play on my end. And um, this is just showing a basic, very simple shadows demo from an educational module that we developed at Ball State using the RSA Cosmos Sky Explorer software. And it focuses on fifth grade next generation science standards. Um, 
this one in particular is asking students to demonstrate what they can represent, uh, that they can represent data in a graphical display to reveal patterns and daily changes in the length of the, um, in the length and direction of, of shadows. So um, let me go back really quick. So you could pause it if you're following along on YouTube. Uh, so with the graphs here and with this shadow activity, um, I actually used it for architecture. So architecture students um, came into the planetarium for a lesson on light and shadows. And so I got an email and not all of the collaborations start this way, but I got an email from the faculty member who said that she is one of six faculty members teaching about 150 freshmen in basic design skills for buildings, right? Uh, we are starting a one month unit in design with light and shadows. So of course, I think of stars and dark skies. Do you think we could put together a show explaining how the movement of light source actually moves through the heavens, uh, so the sun, um, how the earth is moving around during the day that shifts the light and how uh, the moon is moving as well and shifts our shadows at night. Uh, so she says that she wanted to um, explain how these change throughout the year, how the angle of the light changes and how the stars um, chase each other in the sky, apparently, um, following the moon and the sun. Um, she said, but not quite and not really, but you understand what I mean. Um, and then uh, she just wants to have the students, these college students who are learning about designing buildings to get a better sense of light, where it's coming from in the sky, how it shifts throughout the year so that they can better design their buildings moving forward in life. I'm gonna go ahead and hit play again. Uh, so we also have worked with geography on GIS data. So geographic Im information systems, which is just basically a way of visualizing geographic information digitally. So here we have um, some of that GIS data put onto um, our earth. And this is all Sky Explorer um, stars and background, the visuals, the, the actual patches or um, the terrain data here is coming from data that was downloaded off of the internet. Um, so this was all done through a grant from the Indiana Space Grant Consortium where we uh, worked on getting a framework of adding this data into the dome. Um, and uh, we had students involved with this. I went ahead and paused the video again, just so you know. Um, so two students from the Ball State Department of Geography worked with us, and then also a student from physics and astronomy. Um, and with that work, we actually designed, uh, the student actually designed a 15 minute planetarium program that introduces GIS to students and the public, which is why we um, at first saw the electromagnetic spectrum, spectral resolution, and we also talk about imaging spectrometers in that intro to GIS. Uh, so there's always a astronomy component to these collaborations that we do. Our main mission is astronomy, so we wanna try to always have that tie in. And it's natural, right? Because astronomy is really everywhere and uh, we can really um, do these cross-curricular uh, projects because we have these commonalities. Um, so this, this uh, uh, volcano here, we're just seeing it in different composite images. We're used to seeing data in, in what we're familiar with, what, what our eyes can detect, which is um, red, green, and blue. So composites of red, green, and blue. But then for GIS and geography, they like to look at, at different composite images of uh, other wavelengths in the electromagnetic spectrum. Uh, so I'm gonna hit play again. We're at a minute and 25 seconds on my end. Um, and then this one is actually not a composite. This is NDVI, which is just a vegetation index. Um, and I say that like it's easy, but if you wanna know more about that, hit me up. All right, so then we also um, have done particle physics. Uh, so a very, very similar to what we do in our department of physics and astronomy. Um, but particle physics is maybe something that's not so much discussed in the planetarium. Um, and we worked with a collaborator um, from Brookhaven's uh, Relativistic Heavy Ion Collider, or RIC. And uh, he 
um, really helped us get these 3D models into our planetarium software, along with our vendors too. Um, and he sent off over this data in OSG format, open scene graph format, which is actually something that uh, RSA Cosmos uses quite a bit. And it, it translated really well. Um, and uh, we could fly around this data in real time and see uh, a little bit of some part of experimental particle physics. And more than that, we can see how it relates to studying astronomy and cosmology. Because at Brookhaven's RIC, um, the again, relativistic heavy ion collider, they collide um, heavy ions to create the quark gluon plasma, which is what we think was around at um, just a little bit after the Big Bang. So at extreme high densities and temperatures, which they can create here, they can actually create this quark gluon plasma um, and sustain it for a, a decent amount of time in order to study it. So we're seeing particle tracks here in this model from um, a central collision point and again, um, it's, this is all 360 on the YouTube link. You could um, zoom around it. And then just for fun, uh, while I talk more, uh, I have my favorite Scott, uh, globular cluster fly through that I rendered out recently and put onto our um, Facebook page. So we have uh, just wrapped up a, oh, let me see. A data? Yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm yeah. almost done. Okay, no, go ahead. You're at eight minutes. I just want to let you know. Okay, sorry about that. Um, all right, so uh, we just wrapped up a 15-week um, online series, and uh, it was uh, wrapped up with the particle physics talk. Um, and we've been putting these 360-degree videos up on our Facebook page and social media um, accounts as best we can. Facebook is really good with 360. So uh, I think we put up great content. If you want to follow us, um, please do. All right, I'm done. All right, awesome. Thank you, Dana. These are amazing. So uh, our next speaker is actually Amata Zai from Kogi University. He's going to talk about um, kind of bridging the gap between Dana and myself, uh, talking about some drone uh, photography and photogrammetry that we do at Kogi to map on the surface. So take it away, Amata. Awesome. Thank you, Dana. That was that was awesome. Dana with why. Um, so uh, I'm Matt, I work in IT with Joe. I kind of dabble in a lot of little things. Um, so I just wanted to do a quick, and I'm gonna sort of speed through a couple of things just to be mindful of time, because um, it gets a little bit technical. So uh, during Q and A or after, if you have any questions, please feel free to uh, uh, to reach out. So the, the basics about drone data and collection sort of uh, are, I like to treat them as like a mini project, right? Like, what do you wanna do? You plan it and then you do it. And so in the sort of what do you want to do, we like to cover a couple of things. So like, you know, are you going for the sort of beauty shot uh, of your campus? Are you putting a show together in your dome? Are you, uh, do you need to justify some, uh, some, some funds and sort of do a little cross purchase with someone else and say like, hey, I can do some site surveys. Do you want to do vegetation stuff? Uh, and this is sort of using a regular RGB camera, not, uh, not near infrared. So the color schemes don't always match what you may be used to. Um, but so you kind of pick what you want to go through um, in that regard, and then uh, then you kind of plan around that. And so uh, sort of safety first in mind, you uh, I call it, we submit flight plans and sort of what we want to do. We put parameters, sometimes that's for spotter and kind of things like that. But um, <clears throat> we use a variety of tools. Uh, so for example, the weather app, making sure it's good, not pouring like it was earlier today. Uh, we make sure our, you know, our drones in, in good sort of operational health. Uh, we use planning apps to sort of help us with uh, sort of the mission that we want to do. Uh, and then we process the data. Um, sometimes it's to do photogrammetry and sometimes it's a uh, little photo correction and stuff like that, which is why you see the Lightroom logo. Um, so this is kind of um, a quick snapshot of what mission planning looks like. So uh, we take a quick view of Google Earth or depending on what app you're using, um, the, the satellite imagery that it has. And then you kind of say, 
this is my point of interest. This is where I'm going to fly. And so on the on the left, you see sort of a grid pattern. On the right, you see an orbital approach to uh, this is our observatory uh, on Colgate's campus, the foggy bottom. Um, and so what does that look like? Well, this is what sort of where the drone stopped to take a picture at any one of these points. So uh, on the left, again, you sort of the grid pattern on the right, you can kind of see the orbital photo stack uh, at that point. Um, and so, you know, the weather was good. We checked out. We planned, we planned a mission. It looked good. We flew it. And then this is sort of what we start to, to get with sort of that, that view there. And so um, there's a lot of tools out there and there's sort of more and more coming to the market. Some are open source, some are, <clears throat> some are awesome. So um, just a quick, you know, if you're trying to dive into it, uh, wanted to sort of outline a couple, a couple things, right? So Let's see, starting from left to right, drone deploys mission uh, and process by drone deploy. You kind of see what that looks like. Uh, in the middle is PIX4D uh, as sort of as planned by PIX4D and processed by PIX4D. And then all the way to the right, you have uh, drone deploy using both data sets to produce a different model. So um, you can start to see sort of improvements along, along the way. And it's never a perfect, always do it this way. Um, there's always so many parameters to look at. And so, with that, um, you can kind of see like in some cases, artifacts or smudges start to appear. Uh, and so you really got to take a look at the whole model and kind of work your way work your way around it. Um, and so just a quick note about the tools. Um, so Pix4D and Drone Deploy operate in the cloud um, <clears throat> at, a very, at a very high level. Uh, the middle option is from Autodesk. Um, it's a recap photo. It's also partial cloud. Um, it's partial uh, on your computer or partial local. Um, but I sort of separate it because it has a limit of 100 photos if you're using that. And, and I like to highlight it because in, it traditionally is free for education. So uh, it's a good entry entry tool. And then of course, you have the sort of local processing that Pix4D and Metashape uh, offer. So the limitation isn't photos anymore, it's uh, processing power. Um, lots of ways to share the data. Uh, anything from uh, 3D model uh, sharing to um, <clears throat> some exports that you'll see in just a bit that you can do via drone deploy or Metashape. Uh, this is one of them. So we took that model that was uh, generated by um, by uh, by drone deploy. Uh, we did some exporting, and this is it in the dome. So this is a picture, uh, sort of sitting in the dome, looking up. At and what it looks like on the dome, which was kind of a cool experience. Uh, you can also export them. There's just a side-by-side -side shot of what Google Earth saw when we built the slide deck. Um, so construction site is what the, the most recent imagery on Google Earth. And then on the right, you can kind of see the, the, the buildings sort of stand out there. And so lots of ways to present your data. Uh, and so you see um, the three, three dorms on the, on the upper left, and then you see the observatory, the foggy bottom, sort of the, the little structure that's popping out uh, more towards the middle there. Um, <clears throat> so just a quick snapshot of different things you can export, how, how accurate you can get um, other, other exports. This is, this is more from Metashape. Um, you can get really, all, all sorts of formats are supported. And so um, down below, the one that kind of keeps getting hidden when I move my mouse is uh, Google Earth uh, KMZs and stuff like that. So sort of next phases, if you wanna keep doing or do more advanced stuff, or maybe your research partners um, can't do cloud stuff, um, Metashape and a few other things uh, provide cluster-based uh, processing. So you can really expedite your processing if you're bringing your, your imagery back to, back to your sites. Um, I'm gonna kind of skip these. These are just sort of tips that we use within the mission planning. Um, weather. Uh, I include the weather because this sort of cloud cover will uh, will definitely um, give you really good results uh, because of the diffuse lighting. Uh, you all are photographers in one way, shape, or form, and so anything you learned about photography, those are pro tips for doing it with the drone as well. Um, keep your data uh, because you can always reprocess it later. So this, I like to show this example. Um, the very first time we processed this, there was some some smudges that you see on the on the chimney, um, but you don't see them the second time we process, sort of as the algorithms get better. Um, we'll skip these. And so uh, once we share out the slides, you can look at this link, but here is what the data that was processed looks like. So um, all those photos that you saw produced uh, this. And so the focal point was the observatory and that sort of is the whole model. Uh, and you can slice what you uh, export and, and keep but you know, kind of the further out you get, the, the less detail you have. And so like the van is not complete or 
the back of this shed is actually missing. So you can always go back, take more pictures, uh, include your, uh, and to sort of keep growing your, your model. Um, and so with that, uh, I'd like to turn it over to Joe. Hopefully I stayed within time. Right. No, you, you, you're good. Yeah, a few seconds over, but that's okay. Thank you, Ahmad, that was great. So let me uh, share my screen now. And uh, I just want to start off by Dana, I fixed the slide. Your name is spelled correctly, my apologies. Okay. Yay. All right, so um, I'll just get right into it. And let me just reset my timer so I know. Okay. All right, so uh, here's our dome, Ho Tung Visualization Lab. Again, we're in the kind of a intimate setting there of about 59 seats. And uh, being set in a liberal arts institution, it is really nice uh, to be able to collaborate with many faculty and being that liberal arts setting allows us to do that. So these are just some of the uh, departments that we work with. I'm gonna focus on uh, just three of the departments to show as examples for time. Uh, one is uh, archeology span and anthropology. Those are actually combined at, at our university. Uh, focus on geography and geology. So it's gonna tie into both Dana and Ahmad stock as well. So let's start with uh, some of our geographers. Uh, the latest one that I worked with is actually Mike Laranti. He's an associate professor of geography. Uh, his actual research, uh, he says he's the Arctic region in Northern Siberia and Alaska. And he actually looks at how like um, uh, environmental changes uh, due to uh, climate change or like how does the melting of permafrost affects climate change and vice versa. Uh, he takes students uh, on site uh, usually every summer and sometimes even during the academic year to fly drones to capture data. And then he actually brings it back onto our dome. So just kind of give you an idea, this is the region that we're talking about, kind of this Northern uh, area, kind of a wide area filled mostly with bogs, you know, as folks who know that area, especially in the, in the summertime. So uh, what he does, he actually, like I said, takes drone data, Here's uh, one of those uh, captures. Again, there's some bad data points on this with this particular drone. But we were actually able to take the 3D model, map it onto our dome surface using uh, Digistar 6 and also programs like GDAO and uh, some custom JavaScript tools uh, actually customized by Jacob Galloway from ENS and other folks. It's a very uh, special thanks and shout out to him for helping me through some of these uh, data kind of <laughs> uh, reductions and whatnot. But uh, so this is the same site taken with a fisheye. You can see a couple of the students there up on the top left. And so this particular site shows a lot of erosion. This is actually a lake bed that is typically frozen during most of the year. It is now totally melted and they're seeing a lot of erosion like this. So in here, you'll have like lots of old tree roots and, and actually many fossils and whatnot that have bubbled up to the surface. And this is actually, all those mudslides are like frozen ground that's now slid down. So here's one of the large areas. This is actually showing a uh, different forestry. So from uh, a dense forest and also a low density forest. And you can see the upper part of that image this is a force that actually burned. And so we can actually map this on the dome again to give the students a sense of kind of immersion. Uh, here's that same data taken with some remote sensing that we mapped onto that same surface. You can see the little path, that kind of red path, that's actually was a bulldozer that went through to stop the fire and to stop it from burning the rest of the forest. So only one area got affected. All right, so our next example uh, comes from the geology department. This is actually uh, Joe Levy. He's actually kind of a rock star at Colgate and in his field, he studies uh, mainly the Antarctic region. And he has like a lot of uh, LIDAR data from the McMurdo Dry Valleys. This is kind of our one example. He just got a $500,000 grant to actually take students to teach them how to do drone mapping and drone photography. And uh, we map that data onto the dome to do fly arounds and look at micro features of types of erosion and melting of the Antarctic ice to see how that affects climate change. And so here's some of those samples. So then you can see the dry valleys. Here's up a close sample of that. Again, using similar tools that we did with the geography department uh, with the Digstar and GDAL and also some custom JavaScript. And uh, there you can see some of those uh, erosion features 
they create these dry valleys and actually lake beds. There you can see a lake bed. But, uh, and so actually, uh, so here's the McMurdo station, this is the NSF uh, science research station that uh, Joe actually, when he goes out, uh, takes students, they stay at these little, there's all kinds of, it's kind of like a mini, tiny, tiny little city there. Uh, so very cool. So he hopes to go again, actually very soon to do uh, more drone photography and, and bring this into the dome. He actually uses this features to study Mars and looks at uh, how micro wind and also erosion here in Antarctica might also uh, happen on Mars. And uh, they actually, all this imagery was taken with this uh, little plane you see there at the top as it flew by to map. Okay, and our last symbol because I have like a minute left because I want to have time for discussions and questions. Archaeoastronomy, that's actually a big thing at Colgate. Uh, we had one of our professors just recently retire after 54 years of teaching. And that was, of course, Anthony Avini. I worked with him over the last uh, decade. So I've been there for 12 years. For 10 of those years, I worked with Anthony on a, a course called Astronomy and Culture. But uh, his uh, replacement, if you will, and that is uh, by the name of Oh, sorry, uh, Santiago Juarez, uh, who just started a couple of years ago. He studies the Maya. His partner in crime, his wife, actually studies the Aztec. So we actually got two people uh, in order to, re I, I say, quote unquote, replace Tony Vini. You can never replace him. But uh, so we have uh, Santiago, who studies the Maya. Sorry, time we going off. Uh, let me, 30 seconds here. And uh, so this is a site called Noku. It's actually near the region uh, near Chiapas. So here you can see the eastern side of Chiapas. So again, this is using LIDAR data to map a 3D model onto our dome surface because we do this to actually look for alignments. We know many of the Mayan sites, many of the Aztec sites, as you know, had astronomical alignments or at least alignments to the landscape. We're actually, uh, actually able to see this inside the dome. And so here you can see the actual raw data of, of the LIDAR that came in and then uh, just a quick picture of the actual dig site that he works at. And so here's uh, one of those alignments. It's actually aligned directly in the middle of the valley. The east-west axis is actually aligned perfectly to that landscape. So what we did is we took it and put it onto the dome to see if there are any possible alignments. Now, all this is preliminary. This is just kind of uh, nothing uh, really uh, set in stone you had if it were, but uh, you can see the central plaza right in the middle of the image is actually aligned, uh, so we think, to the rising of the Milky Way, and you can see the sun there on the horizon, we, we managed so you can actually see the sun uh, during the Hileaco rising uh, of the Milky Way, and around the December solstice, at least northern Emerson. December solstice. And so you can see that Milky Way coming up. Actually, the central plaza is aligned to a mountain. And on the backside of that mountain is a cave. And there's actually several caves uh, where these markers are indicating. And so they can kind of see that. And so maybe we'll, we'll see what kind of uh, alignments come out of this as we do more research on this. We hope to go back there in the next couple of uh, summers to go back and actually measure the site. So I need to stop talking because I'm now over time, but I'm just gonna show a couple more images real quick. Uh, so these are some other projects that we worked on. This is Tenochtitlan uh, based on a Rivera's painting that's in the Anthropology Museum in Mexico City. And th this is actually um, one, of us, one of our students actually made this. And so we try to get students actively involved in all aspects. Uh, so we teach them 3D modeling, we teach them dome production, and now we're teaching the fly drones. So very cool. And then I do want to make a shout out. I'm sorry, I'm going to keep talking for like 30 more seconds. Uh, a shout out uh, to the uh, Native America or the, uh, the panel that we had, the indigenous culture panel that we had on Monday. Uh, we actually had for the first time a couple years ago, we called it Stones and Stars. And this was actually, um, I, I don't have any pictures from this event. Uh, this is called Ceremonial Landscapes of the Northeastern North America. Uh, basically, we had several tribes get together and actually had a sit down and discussion about how having to preserve ceremonial sites that we find. So any site that might have some rock structures, uh, we were looking at possible alignments with, uh, with astronomy, that's why you had it in the dome, but we also had all these tribes represented from Mohawks, Onondaga, Oneida Nation, uh, the Nagusat, and then also some of the Guacan uh, uh, tribes, and I'm running over my words. So 
either way, it was a very cool event. We hope to do this again. We're actually going to do it this past uh, year, but, uh, you know, COVID. So we're going to have to wait uh, for uh, in the spring. And then uh, just some of the artwork that our students have done. Uh, of course, folks in Australia might recognize these, some red original dark cloud constellations. And then uh, we have lots of, uh, we do also teach uh, Chinese archaeoastronomy and looking at alignments with the cardinal constellations of these. And then, of course, art and our history. Uh, we partner a lot of folks from art. That's another panel, though, later on uh, today, if you will, in a few hours. So be sure to come back for that. OK. And I need to stop talking because we're late. Our, uh, piece, too, because we do a lot of music and theater, yes. and we have a similar uh, uh, one, our presentation tomorrow on, on that for community yes. building strategies. And we have a shout out to you in our next panel. So um, I want to, there have been a few questions coming in. Yes. And uh, one of the questions that I just saw in the chat here from, from Mark Subaru, uh, how was the planner used during the Stones and Stars event? We actually put up some of the sites. Uh, uh, Lori Rush, who uh, was up at Fort, uh, Fort Drum in upstate New York, uh, we mapped out one of her sites and looked for alignments. And so we mapped onto the dome and kind of spun the sky around, looked at different key points in time. And uh, there was like a passage written somewhere about the moon and the Pleiades coming together. And uh, we, we spun the sky around until we found a date, which correlated a little bit to one of the ceremonial dates, uh, dating uh, around that time. So again, it's all preliminary. We're not really, yeah. <laughs> uh, there's still a lot of research to be done. But uh, yeah. there's a couple other sites that we're mapping out. Thank you for that really great presentation. You just answered one of the first questions already and didn't even give me the chance to say thank you, which was oh, sorry. really, really great. So um, um, actually, let, let's all of us say thanks to all of the speakers of that first session of our day, um, which was really great, as I said. There were some questions already in the chat asked earlier on, um, um, especially during Dana's presentation. Jim Todd said, we did a workshop on that. This is not a question, but I agree. Um, um, so it would be great to learn more uh, uh, um, about the great projects that you're doing. Um, and also, Ian McLennan asked whether the flight plan is filed. I'm not, I'm not sure if <laughs> that was a real question. It wasn't, I guess. <laughs> oh, I can, I can answer that. Um, so part of our workflow is that our pilots um, at Colgate are all licensed, uh, so they all have okay. a Part 7 license. Um, and so that gives, that affords us some leeway in, in how we do our planning. And so uh, part of our safety model is that we partnered with a company from UC San Diego, or the, the team from UC San Diego on a product called RSS. And so we log our, our drone inventory there, our proposed flight plan, any structures that we have, then that goes over to our environmental health and safety group. Um, <clears throat> they assess it, make sure that nothing else is happening across campus that would sort of cause an issue with that. And then um, they say, yes, no, uh, make an adjustment. And then we go from there. Okay. Um, also, there was a question by Dario Tiveron. He asked um, <clears throat> if you could estimate how much time the project took from start to finish. I'm not sure what project that's or, or, or what aspect that was uh, targeted at um and i don't know if that was already answered in the chat but uh the question was how you, what would you estimate for the time from start to finish yeah i think the the question kind of answered itself because you know it varies for from project yes. to project yeah yes okay yeah sure Actually, he, actually, and, he, and he, honestly, yeah. they're never done, right? Like, you can't <laughs> more. No. 